Hello, everyone. In this episode of Director Discussions, this is an absolutely amazing one. I can't believe I'm fortunate enough to sit down one of my favourite filmmakers in the world, the amazing Garth Davis. Garth is the director behind films such as Mary Magdalene, uh, Lion, and most recently, the terrific film Foe. But Garth has very kindly agreed to take the time to sit down with some jackass like me. So, Garth, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, really well, mate. You do have very infectious energy, uh, which oh. I love. Oh, dude, I hope so. So this is, this is, I, I played a nice little cute kid act. Then I hit you with depressing questions and you kind of look like an arsehole if you don't answer them. So that's kind of my trick into it. Cause you, you're not, you're just saying no to this sweet little kid. But I mean, dude, I don't even know where to begin. You've worked on, on countless amazing films. But the first thing I'd love to ask you is what's really interesting to me is growing up in Australia. Normally when I interview filmmakers, it's like, oh, they grew up in LA where you're surrounded by film and you're surrounded by big filmmakers and obviously studios and even in America there is kind of this film is something that's very live I think in a lot more than other countries but so what, what's it like growing up in Australia and being interested in film is was there much options was there accessibility was there like Australian filmmakers you could look up to what was that like for you now that's a really interesting question um movies did play a big part of my life growing up and um when my parents were separated when I was around 12. Um, this was, we were at the time we were living in, in Queensland in Australia, which is kind of Northeast. And uh, when my parents got divorced, uh, my brother and I, who's a couple of years younger than me, we moved to about a couple of hours to a coastal town called the Gold Coast, which you may have heard of. Um, that's also yeah. Margot Robbie's uh, hometown as well. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of a, um, at the time it was, um, you know, a real kind of transient, um, people going there to kind of hit the real estate market, make money and have a surf, it, you know, kind of had yeah, that, yeah. didn't have a lot of, I would just say it would have a lot of culture, I guess, uh, at the time it's changed now, of course, but I guess, uh, growing up, I went through high school there and, um, there's obviously back then there was no internet, mobile phones, none of the stuff that you guys have. What's it? And DVD? I guess, um, are you about to tell me about some DVDs? Well, no, yeah, I guess there were, no, it was VHS actually back then. Um, oh God, you're making me sick. VHS? Well, Betacam, Betacam came first, then VHS. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, that was a tough time for my brother and I growing up with a single mum at the Gold Coast. And um, there was a lot of downtime and um, a lot of big stuff that we're processing growing up. And the thing that our medicine was movies. And, um, you know, we would, you know, we'd, we would put on a VHS and, watch a movie and and back then we made good movies um yeah. so those movies became really inspiring I, I i was only thinking the other day um i remember when i was about 13 i think um one of the kids in our kind of housing uh development that we we're living in uh he was so excited because he just got first blood you know on vhs wow we're going, what the heck is that? And we, I remember we all went around to his house and he had this VHS machine, which was like <laughs> unbelievable thing that played movies. Yeah. And we watched and we watched First Blood. And, and you know, I just remember being completely transported by yeah. these fantastic movies. So I guess, I guess film was really a big part of my growing up. It really is therapy and escape and um, all of those things. That's amazing. And wow. I mean, it's kind of, I think sometimes I take film for granted, like, because it's, I could literally go onto my TV now and pick out a Bresson film and watch it, you know, but that wasn't obviously something back then, like hearing every I'm camera a... to watch First Blood. That's crazy. I know, but I didn't even, um, there wasn't even an art gallery at the Gold Coast. There wasn't even, I mean, the cinema would only play, you know, the, the basic movies. Um, like I didn't really have any cultural input, but I, I was very artistic. Like I always drew and painted. And so I was like a, a like an artist um, frustrated by where I was living in a way. Um, yeah. And um, it wasn't until actually I was visiting my dad in Brisbane. I went to the art gallery and um, I used to go to the art gallery all the time just because that's where I just felt more connected with who I was, I guess. Yeah. and um trying to find some direction and um there was a Fellini retrospect on at the at this at the um wow. and I go who the hell's this Fellini guy and <laughs> um and I, I it was air conditioned which was great because it's a very hot climate and I went into this cinema I sat down and then that was my first foray into you know world cinema I guess wow um, Fellini was your way in and it fucking blew me away so I went I went every day I'd go back and just watch Fellini and I just <laughs> I spent six, seven, eight hours a day. And I watched all of his movies at yeah. this, at this um, art gallery. And 
that's when I started to really get excited about cinema. Not not saying I wanted to be a filmmaker, um, but I was falling in love with um, with story. And um, I guess that at the time, that kind of amazing surrealism. And um, um, so, yeah, I was definitely drawn to to storytelling through through moving picture. And wow, that's that's actually so beautiful that you pick out Fellini because Fellini, the reason he compels me as a as a person, his films is because there's like a love beneath the surface and everything. He deals with humans at their most true and intimate. I recently went to a, oh, I'm drawing a blank. It was the film studio where he had shot most of his stuff, uh, yeah. and it was yeah. it was in Venice, and it like it was amazing just to see his process and you got to see little glimpses, the cameras he used and how he worked and that whole process of kind of Italian neorealism, not to go off on a tangent, but that to me is probably my favorite wave of cinema. You know, I'd probably yeah. take over French new wave or German impressionistic because to me that was, there was such a true heart, like bicycle tees. I don't know if you've seen that, but I have a poster for it. No, no, I love the neorealist stuff and uh, Pasolini and um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All, all of that stuff. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's also that Italian thing too. So I had a real thing for Italy and um, and, and what I love about, I mean, Italians have spirit, you know, they have yeah. this um, unapologetic expression and they're very tactile. Um, that they're, they're also, despite the kind of masculine bravado, there's definitely a respect for the feminine. Uh, there's yeah. kind of real matriarch, Madonna de Laco, all those kind of things. So um, they're, they're, I don't know, there was something in the Italian filmmakers that, I chimed with. In fact, I did end up living in Italy for a year um, when I was 19. No way. 20 um, uh, with an artist called Valley Myers. She's she's not here anymore, but she was a, a kind of a radical fine artist. Uh, that's a whole story in itself. So I lived in this, I lived like a hippie on this farm in Italy. <laughs> and I really did feel like I was in one of those neorealist movies. Um my God, uh, that's the dream. Be living like a hippie on, on the Italian countryside. You've lived some life. That was fun. You've lived some life. Fun. Yeah, but that's and and I think what compels me about Italian cinema is that love. And so when I was sitting down ready to interview, I was doing research and I was thinking like, normally whenever I used a director, I ask myself, why do I love their work? And it was weird for this. I was like, your work just compels me. And I, I was thinking, I was like, there has to be more than that. Like you can't just go and say, oh, your work compels me. But then the more I thought about it, the more I watched your films, even in something like Faux, which is obviously a sci-fi film it's not really it's a film about two people it's a film about love and then i read some of the interviews you talk about where you talk about kind of the human condition and what appeals to you and it's even in these stories like mary magdalene seeing you tackle love and spirituality is that what compels you as a filmmaker ideas like love i uh, i mean yeah i think relationship in love is is what i guess is for me is like the center of existence and the center yeah. of the universe i feel like it's one and the same thing so when you truly surrender to unconditional love, and I mean, really embody it, um, yeah. you're suddenly connected into, into, into kind of like a pure life force, um, and and amazing things happen in that space. I, I guess um, it's just something that I have experienced and feel very powerfully in my own life. Um, it's definitely a dimension that is very active in my existence, I guess, um, and. I just feel like it's in all of us really. And, and yeah. so much of that side of ourselves is not really acknowledged or celebrated. And and there's a lot of people that are, are not even aware of it, you know, at all. Yeah. Um, and I guess going back to those early movies, I felt like in some of those movies were aspects of inspiration and creative vision that inspired those really healthy parts of who I was as a human being. Um, and um and, and I guess I'm hoping that whatever I make contributes to that um, awakening and connection within audiences uh, into yeah. the good aspects of who they are. Um, I'm not I'm not interested in anything else. For me, everything else is meaningless. And I mean, I've been on many a deathbed with my grandfather, my my father, and all sorts of things. Yeah. And sadly, for a lot of people, it's not until they're in those dying moments do they appreciate what life really means you know yeah. and um and and why did i waste my time in that job why didn't i do that and there's all these kind of regrets suddenly and i feel like um i i don't know I, the, the movies i make i try to entertain of course but I, i'm hoping that there's something um meaningful there that contributes yeah. to an audience's um uh, own kind of journey i guess 
And I think that's why I connect with your film so much. Because I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that I, 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 like, I know sometimes people go into a film and they'll come out and they, they'll like it, but they won't know why. They'll be like, I guess it just emotionally affected me. And, you know, I think it's that thought process. Like if someone goes to see an action film and they really, really love it when they come out, it's not because of the shooting. It wasn't the two hours of shooting that compelled you. It was the characters or the emotions or the scene. You know, it's like no one loves Jaws just because of the shark at the end of the day, like, you know? And so what I'm, what I'm trying to ask you is, do you have to be yes. willing to be vulnerable with your audience? Cause that's like, for me, that's such a terrifying thing. Cause I'm working on my first short film now. And it's like, I've spent so long talking to filmmakers. Like once you put it out there, you do kind of have to be willing to give yourself to an audience and put yourself out there. What's that like for you as a person, as an artist to make films and put them out there? Do you, do you have to be willing well, to be I, vulnerable? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good point. And um, I think John Cassavetes always said, always be a beginner and, and <laughs> like always be a beginner. Don't, don't feel like you've got it all worked out. Like always that, that feel, you know, when you're a beginner, you, you're actually just acting on, on your creative impulses, you know, like it's, it, there is a, you're full of fear of course, but it's that, it's that kind of crazy um, inspiration to kind of leap into something um, and to try something out. And, and I guess, I think you're right. I, I really feel that the best thing to do is to leap forward with um, with what you want to make and and trust that putting yourself out there is at the end of the day is going to lead to a more beautiful piece of work. I think and and but you are going to be victim to criticism and yeah. and um, that that is something that um, is is has become a huge part of of popular culture um, and you know, individual people becoming very powerful in a critical space um, yeah, yeah. With, with no real uh, reason for them to be there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that um, one of my, the advice I give to young filmmakers is always just find your voice in your work because, you know, at the end of the day, that's going to be healthier for you. Um, and then also it's going to create this beautiful, unique piece of work. And I mean, imagine, that's what I love about filmmakers that are very, um, committed to their own vision because it creates all these beautiful different types of artists. So I like going to the movies and go, okay, that's, that's definitely Tarantino. That's Spielberg, wow, you know, yeah. and like those auteurs are wonderful because at least we're getting these rich points of views. Um, and rather than this kind of homogenized cinema, we're getting distinct voices. And, and I think that's, that's what society should be like all these different, beautiful, rich, distinct voices. So yeah, you should just be you, my friend, don't second guess. Amazing, yeah. what other people think and um and 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 really try and trust that that's enough you know yeah wow that that's that's really amazing especially to hear from someone like you who i kind of like because i look up to filmmakers like you and i truly mean that man and it's like you never really think that you know you're human as well and that sounds weird but i never considered the filmmakers i looked to, up to as being human in any way i think they just got there and made these films but they hear that you know you've kind of dealt with these same things that's really beautiful and i'd love to ask you how long was it, do you think, before you found your voice as a filmmaker? When did, when does that process happen? Did, did you, was it the second you picked up a camera or is it a process of trying to find your voice and emulating and imitating? Or yeah, no, that? no, it, it, took, it took a little while because um, there's all this process in the way of finding your voice. Like by that I mean is when you first start out, you're literally just, it's the fundamentals of making it, you know, that, that, yeah. that, that um, until you have a grasp of that, I, I feel like, you know, your spirit or your intention can't come through completely. Um, so yeah. I guess when I started, it was, um, you know, it's probably like these painting schools that make you copy Rembrandt for two years <laughs> before you go off on your own, you know, like th th there's a reason for that. Um, so you learn your craft. So I guess when I was first, I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't go to film school. Um, it was my passion that was making me pick up a camera. I didn't give a shit what anyone thought. I was just making what I wanted to make. Wow. But, um, but I guess I was trying to, I guess I was inspired by other art, uh, filmmakers and artists. So I, I guess I, I was gluing onto um, examples of work as a guiding principle. So my work wasn't truly me yet. It wasn't my voice, but I was learning how to make films, um, being inspired by people that inspired me. Um, so I guess I was trying to learn, find my voice within that process. But um, I guess, um, well, actually I was um, invited um, to do a, it was like a, we had, there was an event that was coming up in Melbourne where there was a, a live opera singer that was going to sing an opera song to, 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 to pictures, to images. 
Um, uh-huh. And I was selected to do one of these songs. I mean, I, I hadn't really made anything, maybe one short film, if that. So my song um, was about uh, birds that sing in the shadows. So metaphorically, people that are kind of not seen in society, I guess. Uh, yeah. And so I just got my Super 8 camera and I was living in a pretty rough and wild part of Melbourne. And um, I decided to try and find those characters in real life that live in shadows metaphorically. So I, I went around with my Super 8 camera and filmed all of these um, portraits of these real life people. And it took a lot of courage to step into it, but I, I literally wasn't referencing anyone. I was just following with a, with a gut feeling. Yeah. And I filmed all of this and I was cutting it together on, on my I shot on a Bolex and I was, I was super great and I was cutting it all together. Wow. And I, and I projected it in my, um, I remember setting up this projector in the lounge room with my share mates and we said, let's watch this. And we played it and it was actually emotional. Like it was, Wow. I just, we all just got chills and felt emotion. I go, and that's when I fell in love. That's when I fell in love with cinema. I go, ah, oh, it's not about how cool a shot is, what the style is it, or, or look at me, I'm, look how clever I am. It was like putting this image and this image together created this. Yeah. Something I I wasn't planning. And um and I realized actually it's alchemy. It's it's in its purest form, it's like a watercolor. You know, you put a, a blue and a yellow, you get green. Um yeah. you don't paint green, you, you put the two together and you get green. And and I realized it was very intuitive and instinctual process. For me anyway, um, you know, I'm not someone that storyboards the film before we go and, you know, I, I like to let it come to life in an intuitive way first um, to get all the elements. So I guess um, that's when I realized, okay, I obviously have um, a natural fit with this intuitive type of filmmaking and and the result was something that I felt was unique and special. And, and that's when it all, when you get that little seed and then you run with it. Wow. That's amazing to hear you talk about that emotional connection. I think that is why cinema connects with people because it is, I think it's almost, you know, an art of trying to, an art of connection. You're trying to build empathy with your audience. You want your audience to care about your character. I remember I was interviewing Christopher McQuarrie, who's one of my favorite filmmakers. And he, he remember he read a review of Top Gun that said it was almost as if each scene was built for maximum emotional effect. And he was like, well, yeah, that's kind of the point, you know, of filmmaking yeah. when you can have, that emotional yeah. effect. So building that emotional effect on an audience, because sometimes I watch a film and I'll be like, I remember this happened with After Sun. I watched After Sun and afterwards I was like, I didn't like that film. But then I then I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was like, oh my God, I just don't like how it made me feel at the end. And that was yeah. the, that was the, one of the first times I ever actually felt that in such a true way. I was like, I just didn't like the emotional effect it had on me. But it did yeah. have that connection. How hard is it to build that connection with the audience? Do you just have to hope the audience will connect with it or is it you in the editing room over and over again? What's that process like of building connection? Oh, it's, um, it's, it's the mysterious, um, look, there, there are formulas you can follow that will, that will work on a broad scale, I guess. But, um, I don't know. It's one of those things that I'm constantly, wow. it's one of those things I was just constantly assessing. Um, it's the magic of cinema in a way, I think. Well, you know, it's also, you know, the work that you're creating, it's coming into a psyche of the time as well. And and is is society ready for this movie? Are they yeah. going to accept it? Are they willing to have the patience to watch something or are they going to be on four devices at the same time while they're watching something? So it, it it's it's definitely getting trickier, I, I think, um, in terms of how to wow. how to connect. Um I, I, but I don't know. I think I think uh, personally I, I think that uh, my feeling is that I like to try and engage my audiences with a bit of a challenge because in a way that's very satisfying to be asked to be engaged in something um, yeah. rather than just being, you know, fed, fed the numbing agent, um, which is fine. We all need that occasionally, but I guess um, I'm hoping when you come to one of the films that I make or stories I tell that you're going to be transported to a visceral experience of, of, of in nature and landscape um, to be reminded of our connection and also hopefully be in a deep intimacy with characters that are going through something complex, um, which needs you to engage and relate to, um, um, to have a conversation with emotionally. So I guess for me, it's, um, I'm hoping to bring audiences in to a, to a journey that asks a lot of them, but also can be very rewarding. Yeah. 
And that's such a fascinating point you brought up there about films kind of changing. Like, could you imagine if Tarkovsky put out a film now? And like yes. people, people would go out to cinemas and be like, ah, they'd pull out their phone and then you'd someone next to you would be scrolling on TikTok or something. And so yeah. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated just by how cinema is going to change, especially for me growing up in that landscape, because we're seeing kind of advancements every day. And I, I was talking to a filmmaker and he told me like, within the first 10 minutes, you have to grab them. And to me, that was fascinating because that probably wasn't a problem. 20 years ago because if you paid to go into a cinema they had your money you know you were going to sit there but nowadays it's like you have to have that hook within the first 10 minutes because people will decide i know just change not too late to find a different film and so uh it's easy for you you're on the way out but i have to worry about these things man you know what i'm saying so now i'm messing Um, no it's true it's true it's true it's true and um you know the irony here is that you know depending on the way a film is marketed you know people can come into the cinema with an expectation yeah. that marketing or the filmmaker that's made it and they're happy to sit through the press the first 20 minutes of silence and it's okay because it's you know some you know they've got some sort of kind of you know false context going into it but yeah. if you're coming out with an original filmmaker you know your 10 minutes of silence is going to be judged very differently <laughs> yeah god man exactly and it is that do you have you had to change the way you make films because of how the the kind of evolution of cinema right now is also changing do you have to or has your no. process never really been touched by that uh look I, I guess um i guess one of the look I, I think good stories and good cinema and good filmmaking is always going to exist because it in its own right you can't deny it it's it's, it's a beautiful yeah. piece of work but you know I, I i do see a lot of um you know there there are a lot of uh, formulas, percentages, catchphrases around things that, that there are a lot of statistics now because of streaming of, of what people are actually yeah. clicking on. So, you know, these these studios and that they have a list of things that they're looking for. We're looking for ah, really? Like, like literally, you can literally just download the list of if you tick these boxes, then eighty percent of the audience is going to be clicking on this. So th- there is definitely a formula that obviously will change, but there's a formula that a lot of producers will be wrapping their development around um, yeah. and um, because they know audiences are going to work with it. So what I'm trying to say is it's not necessarily a story that's inspiring. They want to tell they're trying yeah. to find a story that fits a formula. And I guess that's the, the challenge, um, especially with TV too. Like um, clearly the more episodes, the more that the more, the better it is for a subscriber, you know, or for, 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 for a network. So at what point does that story fall apart? You know, it becomes a slave to the requirements of more product, you know? So I guess in all of this, um, sadly, well, not sadly, but I guess all of this, you know, where does true cinema and true autistic autistic and, and filmmaking, how does that survive, you know, um, in amongst it? So that's, that's definitely a real thing. Um, and um, something that we're all navigating. I guess my little philosophy at the moment is um, I kind of call it the Trojan horse. So, you know, the Trojan horse, I guess, uh, you know, delivering an idea that has all of the, that kind of propulsion and maybe it's genre, maybe it's whatever it is that does get bums on seats. And then once they're in there, you you, you kind of, you know, the, yeah. the horse opens up and, and the real reason why you're making it comes out, you know, and um, so... That's amazing. I think that that certainly applies to foe, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. That, that's yeah. certainly, I think, a film where people will think, oh, sci-fi. Star Wars is sci-fi. I love Star Wars. And then they go in there. And then there's also that. But then you kind of have that connection between Hen and Junior. And then it is that kind of charge. And that's really fascinating to hear that there's actually kind of a philosophy behind that. And you, you've meant to do something like that. That's, well, that's also kind of, that's uh, No, that's right. And, um, you know, foe, foe, we could have shot like a marriage story, I guess. We could have done a straight drama. Yeah, um, yeah. um which is which is fine uh marriage story is a, a fantastic film um but i guess there was something about um that that kind of near future engine that was really exciting because it meant that you could put pressure on the characters in a way that you ordinarily couldn't you know yeah. um you know these kind of surreal heightened things and i, I find that very fascinating and it, it almost kind of mirrors where we are in society you know where we're kind of um we are under these kind of surreal pressures in our lives um, yeah. that, are, that are kind of beyond the flesh and blood, you know, with all of this virtual reality and artificial intelligence. And, and I guess I'm just very fascinated in, okay, guys, we're being swept up in this technological future and this, in a way, this kind of 
uh, an abandonment of the physical body in a way. Um, yeah. Where does our humanity sit in all of this? And um, yeah, how do we hold on to that stuff? So I guess, I guess for people that were expecting some sort of big sci-fi and were very disappointed they didn't get it, kind of missed the whole point of the film. Exactly. Um, and, yeah. and, um, but that's what I thought was really exciting about Foe is that it kind of has that direct conversation around relationships and our humanity in a, in a, in a world that's, you know, challenged. Yeah. And that, I think that's what compels me. I talked a bit about your work, but not being able to articulate what compels me about your films, but I think it is that love. And I think love is something that compels, it definitely compels me to cinema. I remember I read a quote, I think Paul Thomas Anderson was quoting Hitchcock when he said, shooting love scenes should be like shooting murder scenes, you know, in a way. And like, to me, that was something that I was like, wow. Cause it was the first time I actually talked about the idea of constructing love in cinema. And it is mm. something you have to build. And so I'd love to ask you, about, you know, before we wrap up, obviously my last couple of questions, building a film, what is that process like? I mean, in the editing room, like you said, you don't storyboard. Do you have, you know, are you heavy in pre-production or is it really post that's the most work goes into or is it while shooting? What is your process of constructing? It's it? it's it's full on all the time. <laughs> so, really? really? Yeah, yeah. No, there is no, there is not one stage that in my mind that's um more or less than another. I mean, pre-production is the most important. Yeah. One of the most important parts in a way because it it's your, it's your only opportunity to have the space to think conceptually around what you're doing. It's a chance because at a certain point you can't dream anymore um, yeah. because you have to be make you have to be nailing down decisions for all of the departments to follow through with that vision. So there's a certain point it's much harder to radically change an impulse or a point of view because the okay. machine's running. Um, and then I guess that more, those kind of more spontaneous impulses, uh, are then left for the for the for the day itself, you know, when you're with the actors, yeah. um, and that that's where the magic happens. But uh, yeah, look, I can't stress enough um, just how important preparation is, and um, yeah. and um, putting as much into that as possible. Um, and by that, it's not finding all the answers to everything. It's really exploring the depths of the story to make sure that you know you've you, you, there's no holes in the characters. Um, your actors are filled with really rich ideas and um, that they want to try on the, on, in the scenes. Um, so you got to, it's got to feel exciting and rich and uh, you got to be, feel very grounded in the, in, in the world of the story that you're in. Um, so that when you arrive on set, you're not working those basic things out anymore. It's, it's, everyone's kind of sitting in the DNA of the story. And then, you know, the characters are already alive when they walk into the house, you know, and um, yeah. scenes start to play out. Um Wow. So yeah, it's but then I guess the editing is um the editing is definitely I guess the editing is about a relationship with an audience. You know, that that's that's when you actually sit down and watch it and go, okay, what's the experience of watching this thing that we've been imagining for all this time? Like, is it working? Should there be music? And and I guess that's where you start to you're talking about finding the voice of your finding your own my, my own voice as a filmmaker. You've also got to find the voice of your film. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's interesting, uh, and each film has a very different voice, um, and a diff a unique need. And, um, so it's, it's when you've put that scene together, cut it in a certain way with the right type of music, you go, oh, that's the movie, that's our movie there. And you feel the feeling of the movie. Um, that's the magic of editing for me is when wow. suddenly you, it, it, it's undeniable. It doesn't need you anymore. You yeah. go, it's, it's like it exists and it just flies by itself. It, it exists in its own right. And, and that's when you, you know, you've found what that film needs to be. Do you hate the first cut of your film? No, I love the first cut because usually it's done by the editor. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, the assembly, the assembly is done while you're shooting and I don't, I don't watch assemblies really? at all. No, no. I just like to, um, they just call me if there's an issue, um, uh, you know, like I've missed a shot or there's a line cross or something, you know, if, if anything like that emerges, which is very, very rare, um, that that's the only time I want to really think about the edit. Um, so what I do is I have a week off after the shoot and then I go to the cinema and I watch yeah. their assembly. So we sit in the cinema and just watch the assembly. And it's usually, you know, between three and four hours long. Um, 
and you just watch it. And what I love about that is you just get a, you just get a, a feeling for the story as a whole, you know, you get a feeling for the, for the structure and, yeah. um, and uh, I find that yeah. super useful. I suppose the first time you see it, it's a lot more that emotional connection because when by the time you've seen it five times, I'm sure it's a lot more technical. It's more that cook could be there, but the first time it's more of an emotional experience. Would would, would you say that's fair? Yeah, it's 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 a it's a multitude of feelings because you're still got the the residual of the shoot in yeah. your emotions. You 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 wow. maybe there's some stuff that's not working as well as you thought, which you know. So it can be confronting, can be. A relief it can be exciting but it's not in any way the movie it's just literally uh, I, like it's the clay on the board you know just thrown down and these are all the bits of clay that you've you've created yeah. and you're looking at it um but i really I, I like that it's not precious i like the 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 openness of that um of, of that of seeing it in that way and it's kind of raw form and then you know you do get like you say you do get these moments of not being able to see it because you're so close to it, but there are certain points where you do make a huge leap in the edit where you've kind of radically made it more muscular. You've got to a certain point and then you see the movie with fresh eyes. Um, wow. Can you watch your so own we would edit? So we would edit for, we would go along and then when we, when we did a pass that felt like we'd made a big step forward, then we would go and book in the cinema again and go and watch it like at the end of the week. So, you know, we'd probably watch the movie on a big screen maybe every three weeks in the edit room, um, oh, yeah. you know, just, just to kind of, like you say, just refresh the eyeballs, get into a different space. And then we'd start putting it in front of people as well. Just a couple of friends, people know nothing about the story and just kind of gauge comprehension, like more than anything. Um, yeah. And just Could kind of get it. Um, that's amazing. Can you watch your own films? Because I know some filmmakers are like, they'll watch it once at the premiere and then never again until 40 years later, they're sitting on their couch and it comes on the TV and they're like, this isn't so bad. It's not as bad as it could have been. Can you watch your own films? I don't watch my own films uh, once it's all done and dusted. Um, really? But it was funny because I was, um, I don't know where I was. I oh, were actually, as a Christmas and we're all together, all the cousins and everyone, we're at a beach house somewhere and on the TV line came on. And I, I didn't know it was long. And I just saw these these beautiful children in this village. Oh, that looks really beautiful. Wow. And wow. What's this? And I go, fuck, it's actually lion. You didn't uh, know. <laughs> no, I just, I just, I just wasn't, I, I wasn't really, um, I was not comprehending it because I had, I just hadn't seen it for so long. And, um, and I really um, enjoyed it. You've got to realize though, that, you know, if, as a filmmaker, you know, everything you're watching, you're also bringing back the memories of the making of it. Um, and, if that was yeah. a good experience, that's good. If it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, so I guess all this, all this kind of past uh, emotion kind of comes through, um, you know, or if the, the critics were brutally cruel to you or, um, or or whatever it might be, you know, you kind of all that residual shit kind of comes to the surface. So yeah. I have a love-hate relationship with um, seeing my work again. <laughs> well, I, well, I love seeing your work. So I'll take that as you will. Uh, man, it's been such a pleasure. My last two questions. This question I ask every filmmaker, what is your dream project? Is it a personal film or is there some idea out there, some book that you'd love to adapt? Or is there something out there that's your dream project if you had a chance to any film you do it? Or are you happy doing your own projects and creating your own films? I don't have a dream project at the moment, um, I guess. Um look, I just need to find something that really excites me. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's, it's, I know that sounds really ambiguous, but it can be in any genre, any scale, anything, really? but, but I guess, um, I'm very open, um, you know, because I have a background in commercials where I make all crazy shit all the time. So I, I have that filmmaking muscle to do anything, you know, in, in a genre sense, but I just want to find something that, you know, once again, keeps challenging audiences, but, um, I probably I'd like to maybe go into a bigger scale, um, a slightly bigger scale canvas um, where I can kind of play with a bit more of that kind of propulsive nature of the story. Um, so we'll, I've just got to find the sweet spot on that, on that one. Do you know, I'm sorry for asking so much questions. Let's go now, but do you know when something excites you? Like you feel it in your heart. Do you know straight away? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes it's just, you know, straight away. Um, and often it's because I can't shake the characters, you know, so I fall in love with a character or I'm tidy with that character. And then sometimes you find material that um, 
is fascinating is a fascinating world and raises a lot of interesting themes and it's like a, okay how the hell are we going to pull this together into a film so um they're the ones that just take a little bit more deliberation i guess but yeah every now and then like lion for example was undeniable you know it was just a compelling story um i was completely in his experience when i when i read about his true story and so you just yeah i mean you the really good ones you just know straight away um Man, amazing cool. my last and final question finally i told you there will be an end at some point what advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker uh, like I was saying earlier, I, I really encourage people to, um, you know, find find their own voice in their work, and um, and 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 uh, you know, I think that's that's what will make the world such a rich place in terms of um, the art that we put out there in a cultural sense. So I just you know in, inspire people to find their own voice in their work, and um, and uh, that would be great. Amazing. Uh, Garrett, before we finish up, are you on social media? Is there anywhere people can go follow you or check out your work? Any new projects you'd like to promote or people should go check out? Uh, not yet. There's something close-ish, um, but no, not yet. Um, and I don't do social media. so <laughs> You're not on TikTok? No, I thought you were on TikTok. I could have sworn. No, I no, you. no. My kids are, but no, not me. <laughs> Garrett, it's been an absolute pleasure. Before we finish up, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Uh, as always, you can go like and subscribe. You can follow me on Instagram, Daniel Fee 33. And if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Death Trend Society. Garrett, I'll talk to you a little bit off air, but I just want to say again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to chat with me. It has been a true oh, and genuine pleasure to chat with an amazing filmmaker like you. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, of course, Sam. No problem.